Can you imagine if 89% of an architect's buildings fell down because they weren't very good at their job? They'd be complete outright, but it's, it's somehow okay that 89% of ads are forgotten. Money is just, just wasted, like just poured away. Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world, and our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit aperturehub.co. How often does advertising motivate you to buy? According to today's guest, ad and branding expert, Paul Miller, advertising fails 89% of the time. Stay tuned to hear Paul and your host, Ben Robinson, unpack what has gone wrong with advertising and what companies must do to turn things around. By the end of this episode, you will know exactly what it takes to avoid being bland advertising wallpaper and learn the critical elements of a marketing strategy that builds trust and also converts. If you like swearing, then you are in for a treat. You are going to hear quite a few curse words in today's episode, so fair warning. Now into our conversation with Ben and Paul. We are with Paul Miller, one half of Miller & Smith, which is a London-based advertising and branding agency. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. We're recording this in Geneva, and the reason you're in Geneva today is because you don't live very far away, right? You're now living in Annecy. Yes. How is it running a London-based advertising agency <laughs> from Annecy? It poses its challenges. I mean, I only moved I moved here a, a just over a year ago. I'd been in London for 15 years, more than that, 15, 16 years, and I'd just grown a bit bored. I got stale, and I was on the M25 with my wife and kids, and we were stuck in traffic. I just sort of, I'd had enough. It's like, just tell my wife, so I'm sorry, I'm just not doing this anymore. I'm not sitting in the traffic. Let's go. Let's go and have an adventure. Let's go do something different. And we met in the mountains. We were both seasonaires doing ski seasons years ago. So we, we, we love the mountains. And so we, yeah, we decided to move to Annecy. And then I commute back to London every week. So I do a couple of days in the studio in London. And then I do the rest of the week in Annecy. And actually my creative has massively improved. Yeah. In London, I'm, you know, managing the studio and I'm uh, meeting clients, pitches, presentations, whatever it is. The the three days that I'm in, uh, so the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that I'm in Annecy, just writing. I'm doing the things that clients buy. And that is, you know, what do they get? They get creative, the things that will change their businesses. And so that's what they get three days a week. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and that clarity has massively improved. I kind of almost gone back to why I, you know, it's re- relit in a fire uh, and it's good. I can see how that could work. So, so two days are dedicated to sort of meetings, getting stuff done. And yeah. then three days are dedicated to what marketing's about, right? Which is being yeah. creative. Yeah. Get, so our, the whole shtick of our business is we get you noticed. So an agency, the vast majority of agencies don't get people noticed. They create guff. It's just meaningless wallpaper and we get brands noticed. That's what we do. So how do you do it? We have to like dedicate some time to doing it. It's a really difficult thing to do. Yeah. And the challenge in a way has become harder, right? Because we as consumers are increasingly time poor and, and more importantly, attention poor, right? So yeah. is marketing getting harder, do you think? And, you know, therefore is it, are you doing a better job and everybody else has just sort of carried on doing the same? What do you think people have got worse? So there are no, this is a very big question. I mean, I could talk probably for an hour on that question. Yeah. There are a number of factors. The first factor, we have an hour, by the way. We have an hour, <laughs> yeah. The, the first factor is that the media landscape is ever more fragmented. If you rewind to the 70s, you had a handful of channels available to, you know, and of which the biggest by absolutely miles was TV. Whereas now the media landscape is really fragmented. You know, there's a a myriad of different channels that marketers can choose. And it's almost, they don't know where to go. And that feeds into the second point. There is a a massive dearth of talent in marketing. And that's because the vast majority of marketers are not trained marketers. They've come out out of university having done some bullshit degree. And they go, well, marketing's cool, isn't it? I'll go be in marketing. It's dead easy. It's just pictures maybe some words. And that's why the vast majority of it is rubbish and is ineffective and doesn't work 
because the people that are commissioning it don't know, they're not trained marketers. If you ask them, what are the four Ps? Marketing, they look, look at you with a blank face. Oh, you fucking moron. And that then transpires or like moves into uh, briefing agencies. Because, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, how can you write a decent brief to get an agency to give you the best work? So the agencies get poor briefs, but then they produce poor work. The flip side of that is the leaderships within agencies, just yes men. You know, it, I pride myself on being a pain in the ass. I shouldn't just be a yes man. I should challenge and question and, and be difficult into getting to the answer of why this client has a problem rather than just accepting, well, this is what I think my problem is. And, and, if, and if a client is prepared to have those difficult conversations, then that is when the best relationships and the best work will come out of it. But that's a, a, a whistle-stop tour of, you know... <laughs> yeah, no, but there's a few things to pick up on there. So the first yeah. one is, uh, is that re- what you said there about, you know, everybody thinking they can do marketing resonated with me, right? Because yeah. I remember in the time that I did marketing, it's like people feel there's like there's such low sort of barriers to being a marketer mm. because it's really about, you know, colors and, you know, yeah. and who, you know, everybody understands it. And so it feels really accessible to everybody and therefore everybody has a strong subjective opinion on marketing. Which makes the job very difficult, right? Yeah. You know, how do, there's no objective way to spot good work. Well, there is. Who? Yeah. <laughs> so the, what is the job of marketing? The job of marketing is to create demand. And the job of advertising is to get noticed. Now, people um, manage to confuse the two. So marketing is, uh, if you're in the B2B side, generating leads and if you you know if you're really good like sales qualified leads like ones that are actually worthwhile yeah. and if you're on the b2c side it's shifting more products in the supermarket or you know whatever it is they sell that's the job of a marketer create demand the job of an advertiser is to get noticed you can't create demand if nobody knows you exist so that's why marketers use advertising the, the one of the biggest problems there is that marketing budgets have come under a lot of scrutiny and attention and have been cut you know over the last there's a trend over the last sort of 20 years or so the marketing budgets are in the main cut they're one of the first ones to be cut when a business comes under pressure which is madness why the hell would you cut a budget that gets you noticed if you're in trouble don't understand that yeah the the the, the fl- very cyclical yeah which yeah, it shouldn't be, yeah which it shouldn't be yeah. you know if you're in if your business is <laughs> is struggling, don't cut the thing that gets you yeah. noticed. I yeah. don't understand. Don't cut the oxygen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we accept, which I'm not sure everybody would, right? But the objective of marketing is to create demand. How do you actually demonstrate causality, right? Because this is a field where I think, in addition to everything you've said, right, about the fragmentation of the media landscape, the dearth of talent, I think people have become a bit obsessed by ad tech, right? Because, yeah. because ad tech you know, offered this promise of being able to precisely calculate the exact impact of your marketing, right? So I would add to your list of sort of ills, you know, this obsession with ad tech, which is... Yeah, it's not just ad tech, but like digital marketing as a whole. But ad tech is definitely the problem child within that. The the premise that you can serve the right message to the right person at the right time is bollocks. (laughs) Yep. Like it, it, that's how strong I, I feel really strongly about this. Yeah. Um, delivering a a, uh, a message, a, a perceived targeted message, at a perceived you know targeted person at this targeted moment, it, it goes against all accepted marketing fucking like the fundamentals of marketing. But that doesn't matter if you're selling ad tech you can save a company money because you don't get any, the, 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 the sell yeah. is there's no wastage. Well, of course, the, the flip side of this, there's, there's, there's no, no one notices what you're saying because marketing works on broadcast, not narrow cast. So the difference being, if you serve one message to one person, that's narrow, it's narrow cast. I don't know what that message says about me to my peers. I don't know where I may, what I'm, signaling, virtue signaling, <laughs> which I hate that term, but I, I'm not able to s- demonstrate what I am telling my peers about myself by buying that product. Whereas if it's broadcast, everyone knows that that product exists. So if I buy that product, then I am telling 
uh, and my peers uh, something about myself to them about what I stand for, you know, how much money I earn, uh, what I, you know, what things I'm interested in, you know, like what are my, what are my values, whatever it is. And that's why it's effective. And of course, just by, just by being broadcast doesn't mean that it's effective, but it is an effective medium, an effective channel. You then need to layer that with something that's going to get someone's attention. So that's advertising, that's creative. How do you get someone's attention? We do the complete opposite to everybody else. If you are the same as everybody else, you are wallpaper. You are, you are, you, it's incredibly difficult to get someone's attention if you're the same as everybody else. Whereas if you're different to everybody else, you will be noticed. And so the, the research that backs this up or sort of s- steadfastly supports this is the IPA did some research a couple of years ago. The average Londoner, and it's the same for uh, any built up urban area, but the, the, the research was done in London. The average Londoner sees a thousand ads a day, TV, radio, print, social media, digital, whatever it is, a thousand ads. Of those thousand ads, 89% of them are immediately forgotten. 89%. Only 4% of them are remembered positively, 7% remembered negatively. You, it's, to get in that 11%, is so difficult. I mean, you'd rather be remembered negatively yeah. than ignored. Yeah, to be ignored is, it's a, it's, it is a joke how bad our industry is at its job. Can you imagine if 89% of an architect's buildings fell down because they weren't very good at their job? There'd be complete outcry, but it's, it's somehow okay that 89% of ads are forgotten. And money is just poured in and and just wasted like just poured away you would get more uh traction by just if, if you're going to produce ads that are inside that 89 percent you'd be better off taking that 100 grand that you're going to spend burn it film it and put it on youtube you would get more from that than you would just which is, which is the, the band that did that remember they they got loads of publicity because i think they burnt a hundred thousand pounds i don't know yeah yeah, yeah. but what I like about you is, well, I like everything you're saying, but so... That's okay. That's so kind of you. <laughs> there are a couple of things I want to pick up on. I really, the, the, again, I thought we're really on point, right? One was, let's say just hypothetically, I could target you precisely with exactly the right message at the right time. The problem, the fallacy is that even if I did all that, you'd probably have an ad blocker on. Yeah. And even if you didn't have an ad blocker on, you wouldn't remember it because it wasn't a very good advert in the, in the first place. So in a way, this is why I was talking about this obsession with ad tech, because... We've got so obsessed with the tech and the ability to sort of micro-target that we forget that actually you still need to stand out and it still needs to be a good ad in the first place. Right? Yeah. And then the other thing that I liked about what you were saying was like, there was an academic study, I don't know if you ever saw yeah. it, but it was like the part of marketing that works is the wastage, you know, the wastage yeah. works, which yeah. is because you said it's like, you know, when you see a really expensive, you know, production on TV or whatever, that has a signaling effect that says, this company has money. Yeah. This company can afford good actors. You know. So it's, yeah. so in a way, just because we can't measure the impact of it doesn't mean that it's that it's wasted, right? Yeah. So, and then the other thing you said, which I think you you referred to that's to the study, IPA study. Which is, yeah. Yeah. Which is we're not just trying to build demand, right? We're also trying to build loyalty because yeah. loyalty creates sort of price inelasticity and allows you to charge more. And and so at its root, it comes down to what you said, which is get noticed. Yep which is one of, you know, we help you to get noticed as one of your taglines. The other one, which yeah. is take fucking risks, right? And the two yeah. go hand in hand, right? Yes. Because you can't stand out unless you're prepared to say something and stand for something that's a bit different from your peers, right? So yeah. tell us what mediocrity looks like. Because you referred earlier on to this, <laughs> the bland, bland guidelines that you yes. came up with, right? So just, just talk to us about that. Because this, I really like this when I, when I found this on your website. I produced this with one of the most well-known, uh, best regarded, well-regarded copywriters in the world. I would say so, Vicky Ross. She's at, at Vicky Ross Writes on Twitter. She's incredible. And so the two of us teamed up and we worked with Grace, uh, Grace State, who's one of the designers in my agency at Meller & Smith. And we produced the, what we call our brand guideline, bland guidelines as a satirical view of the garbage that we see on a pretty much daily basis so brands will have their brand guidelines and that is the you know the 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 bible almost the 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 the, the this 
this document that cannot be deviated from that is the thing that that brand stands for. And it will contain their vision, mission, their, you know, their purpose statement. It will, what fonts they're using, what colors, yeah. what yeah, imagery, yeah. their tone of voice, yeah. like every, all of the things, right? So you use that. And, and we would get and, sent that. And it's like an inverse correlation right, between yeah. the blandness and the length of the brand. Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 The, uh, like, the 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 more bland the, so, yeah, the, uh, the, the positive longer yeah, yeah. So inverse correlation the other way. Brand, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah sorry yeah and so we get, I get sent these whenever we're working with a new client that you know one of the conversations we write send us your brand guidelines so we can see what it is that you think you stand for and all this kind of stuff and I so I see them every day I would say you know I, four or five a week and they're all the same uh, they all say the same old rubbish that's so bland and vanilla and meaningless. And they think that they're being profound and different. And so, you know, I'm, I'm in a really good position in that I see lots of them, whereas a, a, a brand will probably only see their own um, or maybe a couple of others. And so we, we made the bland guidelines as a, almost like a bit of a piss take yeah. to these things. Satire. It, yeah. Satire. Yeah. People see it and they go, shit, that's, yeah, yeah it's that's just, us. You know, you know it, it's, I mean, you can post it, but it's, it says, you know, it's kind of goes in our bland story. You know, our bland is the result of many bland meetings and brainstorms where no one in the bland team or the rest of the business could agree on anything. Uh, we're like any other bland, unremarkable. It is our point of indifference, our USP, our unoriginal selling point. Uh, why stand out when you were born to fit in? That's the positioning statement. Uh, our bland purpose is to share bland communications with the world. Our promise is to always go unnoticed. The, the bland personality is we are always daft with D standing for dedicated, A for authentic, P for passionate, H for helpful, T for trusted. I think passionate is one of those that, like company values that's like de rigueur. If you don't yeah. have it, right, you've, yeah. you've missed, you know. It's, it's like saying you're honest. Yeah. It's like, it's like trusted. Like who, the minute someone says, like, I'm, trust me, I'm, yeah, I'm really trustful, trustworthy, you're like, you are obviously not trustworthy. <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's like I'm not a racist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, we, you know, our bland color is blue and classic ivory because, you know, no, <laughs> nobody's that. It will have a this picture of a... comfortable reading for many people that yeah. I, I imagine. The, there, there, will be, there, will be, there will be a picture of a millennial. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, because, you know, and no, no, no bland so is worth the, the millennial their thing is, 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 is worth delving on for a second, right? Because essentially... People have pivoted so much of their messaging and targeting to millennials who who don't have, have any money. Yeah, who don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't make decisions in organisations. Don't have any money. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but they're cool. Yes. So you think? Yeah. And they eat smashed avocado on toast. <laughs> um, no, the the point. I mean, it's a serious point. When was the last car ad that you saw that didn't have a young person in it? Like, well, like when was the last time you saw a car ad that had an old person in it? If the over 50s in the US were their, their country in their own right, they'd be the fifth richest economy in the world. Yet, and they're the people that buy all the cars, yeah. the new ones. Yeah. Millennials rent. Yeah. yeah. And you don't see an old person in a car ad, but you're expecting this old person to buy your car. Like it's not hipsters that are buying Teslas. Yeah. It's 50 year olds. Uh, but you wouldn't think that. Uh, and that's the, and it's a, it's a serious point. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's a, flippantly delivered but it's like millennials don't have any money they don't even exist i mean like they're, they're, they're not even a thing the idea that anyone between the age of 18 and 35 is exactly the same they've all yeah, got exactly the same no. yeah but you know they those people don't have any money yet you wouldn't think that for all the advertising that is targeted at them especially expensive <laughs> things that cost loads of money let's talk about some of your own work where you yeah. uh where you've taken risks or you've you know, you've persuaded the customer to take risks and you've done stuff that's really stood out. So, for example, on your website, you have this video of the 40 Towers yeah. show in London. And that's great. So could you just tell us about that? Because that is, I mean, it's, I imagine it was really successful, but it was certainly super distinctive, right? I mean, yeah. nobody that saw that would ever forget it. Yeah. So there's one of our clients is the theatre immersive theater experience, Faulty Towers. So the TV show, Faulty Towers, they've made a theater experience where you can go for dinner at, in like the Faulty Towers Hotel and they have the actors, the characters playing the part and you have your dinner there. It's been going for 20 years in London, in the West End, really, really successful. Um, and then there was a new uh, entrant 
into the market about a year and a half ago, and they started to erode market share, as you would expect. A new Faulty Towers engine. A new Faulty Towers engine, <gasps> backed by John Cleese. Oh, like, okay. you know, so yeah. John Cleese made his own one. So you'd think that that's, that's clearly, that's a... <laughs> a big powerful competitor in that respect because it's like the guy that like wrote Faulty Towers has gone, well, I can make one of those. So our client came to us and said, you know, we're seeing that our ticket sales are starting to erode. You know, we're not selling as many tickets as we were. Uh, so we need to get out there and tell as, ma- you know, as many people as possible that haven't been to this show, or most, you know, our audience were people that hadn't been to the show before rather than trying to get repeat purchase to, to come buy the show. So uh, we looked at the problem and, and it, it, it came to us, you know, the, our creative answer to that problem was that you needed to get people to experience a little bit of the show, right? Okay, let's do that. What we did was we put the show on the tube, on the Bakerloo line, and we chose that specifically because it, you can turn it into a dining room because of the way that the booth uh, is kind of is, is, uh, laid out. And in the middle of rush hour, so we did it, we ran it from five o'clock until eight o'clock in the evening, the actors on there made the tables, put, essentially put a dinner party on the tube in the middle of rush hour, and we didn't ask for permission. I mean, if we'd have asked, we'd yeah. have been told no. Imagine with the this yeah. health and safety loops yeah. you would have. To and I mean, I had and 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 we ran it, and it was incredibly successful. The amount of people that saw that, that were sharing it, the ticket sales like immediately jumped. They sold, they completely sold out in the most difficult uh, couple of months. So the next the couple of months after that stunt are traditionally their most difficult months to sell. They sold out. They've resolved the problem. They've taken the fight to the competition, and they're back to selling out every night when you know when they uh, when they put the show on. So it completely answered the brief. It got a lot of attention, lots of press attention. So earned media rather than bought media. Um, really, really successful. I mean, I had to bung a, uh, a couple of you know, uh, a couple of notes to the, the attendants on the, on the tube, you know, because they were like, what's going on? And you know, that they there was some sort of bribe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, in a, in a yeah. nice way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, as in, could you just turn and look the other way while we uh, do this? And they did, but they got it. And, and, the, and the, you know, the commuter in London is notoriously grumpy Yeah, and they don't want to be there. They've got their face in somebody's armpit. They're a bit cheesed off. And they, they were absolutely loved. Several, you take up a lot of space. Yeah, you? but they yeah. absolutely loved it, and it's really that's that's pretty risky, and that's it's a relatively risky. small, yeah, it's a relatively small client. But I think it's a really good case study for. But in a, that in type a way, it's very. Just to come back to this point again, because I, I know we've completely. I think we've agreed on about ninety percent of things, but yeah, what you what you are doing there is not only taking risks, not only getting noticed, but you're also adapting to the new world, right? Because that's one in which you're getting in front of people. I mean, you're not using traditional media to do this, right? And then also, you know, the, the act of them sharing it and become very memorable and them sharing it on their channels was very important to success, I guess, right? So, Yes, yes and no. I mean, there is a difference between digital marketing and, you know, people sharing. Just because yeah. you share, like, word of mouth out to your 500 followers on Instagram doesn't mean it has power. Yeah, you know, it has some power. And I'm saying it, uh, it, it's just not as powerful as it was, you know, in years gone by. Yes, uh, it is definitely a new, m- not a new method, but not a traditional method. Yeah, doing a stunt like that. But people have been doing stunts for years. the The point here is we shouldn't be choosing the media before we've settled on the idea. The idea comes first, and then the, like the best possible way of an, you know of bringing that idea to life is that then the media that should be chosen. There, we wanted people to experience, you know, a little snapshot of what it's like. You know, they, they enjoy that that little moment and then they're going to, right, I'll go and uh, buy tickets for Saturday night for, you know, to go out with the, uh, with the wife for dinner and, and, you know, on a Saturday night, right? So that's that's powerful. And the the best way to do that, the best way to show that experience was a live event, was a stunt. Now, if the, if the best way of showing that was a TV ad, we'd have done a TV app. If the best way of doing it was to put it on a billboard, we'd have put it on a billboard. Yeah. Uh, we didn't start with, let's do a stunt. You know, because that's tactics before strategy. You, c- you can only get noticed if you're prepared to take risks. And we're not talking by turning the dial one notch away from the, the, uh, the, the, the competition. We're talking about doing 180 degrees different. You have to be completely different. But that takes guts. To you know, to to do that, you have to be really sure that it's the right thing to do, 
And it's far easier just to sit in the crowd in the congested central yeah. middle ground in, in, a, in an industry. And you're never going to get noticed. You're never going to get decent return on the time and investment that you're putting into your marketing if that is what you're going to do. So it is risky. Now, risks mean different things to different people. And I've been talking, I mean, I've been running my agency now for nearly 11 years. Um, and the first four or five years, we're just kind of getting things off the ground. And yeah, about five years in, we started talking about take fucking risks, telling clients one at a time, you know, you, this is what you have to do and, and selling that methodology and that mantra and, and that mindset. And what transpired was that it took a lot of effort to tell, you know, one boardroom, you know, one meeting at a time. And so, what, three and a bit years ago, we set up an event series called Take Fucking Risks. And it's now, so, I mean, we started in a pub, which is where all the best ideas yep. start. Uh, we were in the pub and... um we were talking about how could we do this. We set up, and we said, right, let's do an event. The first event, 50 people came along to it. I couldn't believe we'd convinced 50 people to come along to an event. You know, no one had never even heard of the event. And that over three years has now grown and we get over 400 people to an event. They're every quarter. They're probably the, the largest creative event series in London. And it's a, it's a, it's a joke. It's a side hustle on the side. You know, we're, we're an ad agency. We're not an event company but we put on probably the biggest event series in, in london for, for the creative scene which is you know if you think about where the real hot spots of advertising and creative are in the world it's london and new york we've managed to grow an event series in one of those two which is the biggest and it's really really successful and people come along and they they're inspired and they should be because it's 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 in your face it's not bland it's not it's not your usual kind of corporate patter. It's no, like it's just, they smack you in the face and actually make you think. Now, we don't give you all of the answers. You know, we give you a, a challenge almost. It challenges you to think. And I've had people come to the event and then email me at like three o'clock in the morning, having left the event, had a, a few beers, and like, right, I'm tearing up what I've been doing for the last six months. Uh, you know, this might be a marketing director, a brand director, a big business. And they're like, right, I've started again. And they're scribbling in the middle of the night and they're phoning me or mex messaging me. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that's like, yeah, I'll have a bit of that. So in a way, you're sort of, with this, with this event series, you're sort of, in a way, eating your own dog food, right? Because you, you're using the event series, A, to stand out, and B, as a marketing tool of your own, right? Because yeah. cause it seems to me that what's disappeared a bit in the market, because, you know, I don't want to get going this, like, you know, get into, into this territory of marketing instead of but it seems that some parts of marketing don't work like they used to right? because because um of this attention deficit problem yeah and i would agree with you that advertising is still as important as it was and brands are more important than they are than they were because we're, you know because we need the signaling effect in a super busy environment a super yeah. crowded environment but then the stuff that was more targeted i don't think you know press releases work particularly well or webinars or any of these things but what does seem to still work really well is actually getting in front of people and on a personal level having quality time and doing really high quality events yeah so you're kind of in a way you know living or you know or subscribing to your own sort of yeah. doctrine i mean that's yeah. it's the it's if you have a different uh, yeah, I, I am one of the very few uh, people that talk like this in our industry. So, you know, oh, we, I'm going to get challenged. And and so I should. The easiest way to um, combat that uh, that scrutiny and that challenge is to practice what I preach. And we do. And so it's a good lead generator for you, is it, the event series? It, I mean, you know, people aren't like coming along to the event and be like, Paul, here's a million <laughs> quid, you know, uh, but... It, you know, it'd be lovely if they did, but it's definitely a, a lead generator. It's an interest generator. We are people are aware of who we are and what we stand for, and so then we are hopefully top of mind when the opportunities come along. You know, where they want to uh, reach out to uh, review their agency that they're working with and that kind of thing. So it, it definitely has generated business, and 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 we've won business off the back of it that we wouldn't have won otherwise. You know, I think we can be fairly yeah. confident of that. And a, and, a, and a general brand awareness that's outsized yeah. compared to the size of the agency. Right? Yeah, because, we're really small. Yeah, I mean, you talk on the website about keeping a purposely small team, which, I mean, certainly is something I would, you know, adhere to as well, right? Which is, I think you can't 
produce really high quality work on a consistent basis if you're running a massive team, you know. Yeah, if I spend yeah. all my time managing people, then how can I produce the best work? No, it's a, it's a blend of the two. So we're a team of 10 and we've never been more than 10 and we've been going 11 years. And um, even if, you know, and even if people were coming to the, I'm going to call it TFR because I keep saying the <laughs> word, the TFR events, yeah. and they were giving you million dollar checks, you still wouldn't go above 10, right? You just, no. like, you'd just be more selective about we, who you work with. We, and we are selective over who we work with as it is. Not because, you know, we're Johnny Big Time and therefore we can pick and choose, but, you know, you have to, you, you have to, Want, you have to fancy it. We're not just going to take the check. We're going to want to produce the best work. And so if you, you as a brand or you as a marketing director or CMO aren't interested in actually producing the best work, then we're, we're probably not going to get along. We're, we're really clear about that. It actually makes us really easy to work with because people know what they get. You know, there's, there's no kind of hidden agendas. So people are, we're really uh, clear and obvious up front about what we're like to work with, the, the benefits of working with us. There's no obscurity. And that's the, I think people value that. You know, I mean, how many times do big brands, you know, choose a vendor and then actually, you know, three or four months down the line, it, it's, it's, it's mired in arguments and debate and, well, I didn't know you were going to do this. I didn't know this was going to cost more, blah, 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 whatever it is. No, we're just really clear up front. And I think people appreciate that. Where do, you, where do you stand? I mean, what's your measure of success in terms of, I mean, we can come back to generating demand and stuff like that, but do you have broader measures of success, of client success? And, you know, do you, are you like really fixated on client retention or do you actually think it's quite healthy when clients change agencies from time to time because they get a fresh perspective? I mean, what's... I, I, I have no time for brands or clients that change agency for no reason. Yeah. The average tenure of a CMO is now 18 months. The first thing that that CMO does is put the agency out for review. Yeah. So you've got agencies, you know, pitching for work every 18 months. It takes about, if you, if it's a big brand, I mean, we, we work with some massive brands. We work with the biggest brand in the world. We work with Amazon, you know, as one of our clients. And we work with some uh, small startups and, and sort of everything in between. It, you know, if you, if, if you go for big pitches with these big, big brands, you know, Fortune 500, FTSE uh, 100, uh, 100 businesses, it takes a year to recoup the, the pitch cost. So if, you, if you're if you on review every 18 months, the agency can't make any money. And so then what's the incentive, you know, to, to actually produce the best work and to and, and go and, uh, go above and beyond? So that's, that's a really big problem. Uh, in terms of how do we you know, what do we fixate on other than getting brands noticed? Client retention, 100%. So like I said, we've been going nearly 11 years. Our longest client uh, relationship is nine years. We, we absolutely fucking, to the point of paranoia about working with clients and understanding their business. We work with some of the biggest brands in the world, some of the smallest ones, and we are fixated on serving them, but not, um, but not delivering a service that is just, yes, 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 yes. It's now, well, let's produce the best work. You will see the best results. You'll then want to work with us more. Yeah, it's really, it's a really simple equation in, in my book. And I, I hate complexity. So I want to keep it really simple. Clients have got a difficult enough job as it is. And it makes it sound like I've got a problem with clients. I really don't. I have a lot of empathy with their situation. Like I said, like the average tenure is 18 months yeah. for uh, the person at the top of a marketing organization with a big brand. You know, that is, and they're under a lot of pressure to deliver. So I've got a lot of time, a lot of empathy for the situation that essentially my client is in. This isn't me just bashing the person. That's, that's lazy. It's, um, it's, it's fucking, yeah, it's no, it's no good. You know, you, you've got to understand the pressures that they're in. I mean, I might speak to my client for two or three hours a week, you know, so that, what, let's call it 5% of their week. That's got to be the most thought-provoking, the most challenging, but also the most fun 5% of their week. Because the other 95%, let's be honest, you know, corporate life can be really dull and really challenging at times. So why the hell would I make my 5% that should be fun and should be challenging and should be the, the reason they're in the business in the first place? Why would I make that the same as everybody, you know, same as their rest of their week? We should add, so into your initial list of all the, you know, the <laughs> ills in the industry, we should add sort of shrinking time horizons and yes. shrinking tenure. 
because you know there's a definitely a positive return on time you work with the client because you understand their business better and you're able to sort of craft the messages better you understand the industry better you know do you think this shrinking tenure of cmos is i mean first of all why is it happening is it because people are more and more impatient to see this you know return on investment and then do you think it also contributes to this you know this sort of return to you know this like return to mean where everybody wants to do something that's a bit bland because they don't want to lose their you know you don't want to be kicked yeah. out after 18 months is do you think that's also part of why you know so much marketing is indifferent and i think it's definitely it's a contributing factor n- no doubt like i said i've got a lot of sympathy for the situation and that's because that, that cmo is under a lot of pressure there's uh, a board to report to they might they might be on the board or they might report into the board uh, there are uh, shareholders to uh, satisfy you know you've got quarterly uh, earnings reports you know to, to deliver on if a new cmo comes in they've probably got three uh, they've got a month to tear it all apart that's the first thing they do they've then got three months to come up with a, a plan you know this is what i'm going to do having to, you, know, you know torn up the plan and then they've got six months to implement that and start to see some results so they've got less than a year having come in fresh n- knowing nothing about that business potentially having no track record within that business they've got a year to deliver some results so of course you know their natural instinct is to put a lot of time pressure on their suppliers their vendors of which an ad agency is going to be one of them to to get results immediately but then you think that's you're not going to get the best out of an agency if you go You've got a week to come up with something. You're like, yeah, fucking out. Well, all right. Yeah, I can, I can think of an idea. We can find an insight and we can create an idea based on that inside a week. Yes, we can. Is it going to be the best one that you can have? No, probably not, because it takes time. It, these things take time, and you have to trust that you're speaking to the right person and you have to trust in their skill uh, and let them do their thing. And I'm not saying we need a year. It just needs slightly more than n- no time. When I, when I started in this industry, I mean, how long have I been in the game? 16, 17 years, something like that. There was definitely more time when I started. And, it, and that really was the last part, you know, sort of the last moments of time being allowed for agencies. And I've just, I've seen it being eroded from that moment. And there's, it's, it's no coincidence that that was when the, uh, the internet really yeah. started to take off. Digital marketing to, uh, took off. Ad tech followed a, a few years after that. And then budgets started to be cut. And, and, and all of those things happened at the same time. It's almost like a bit of a perfect storm of components all coming together. And, and we're now at a moment where more and more ads are just, it's just a waste. Yeah. Like I said, 89%. Just wallpaper. You walk down the tube in London and you walk anywhere, people are just walking past the ads. It's just wallpaper. This shrinkage of marketing ten years and shrinking timescales and you know impatience to get returns and stuff is because of what you said, which is people have become obsessed that because we're in a digital age, marketing has to be done very yeah. differently. What's your advice to a CMO? You know, it's it's you know it's a well remunerated function, but it's a function where, as you said, like the ten years shrinking. How do you do? How does this? What are the characteristics of a good CMO? What what should a a good CMO do well. I mean, when you work with good yeah. counterparts that are CMOs, like what, um, are they, what are they like? There is a mutual respect both ways. I think that's the first thing. They don't just treat me as a a doer supplier. Yeah, like I'm like I, I have a value, and 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 conversely, I have a lot of empathy and, and and appreciation for the pressures of their job. So like a mutual respect going both ways. That's the first thing. The second thing is. An understanding that they can't solve all of their problems immediately. They need to assess what are their biggest problems, uh, the ones that are the most critical, and solve those ones. Really, you know, if we're being really honest, they should do a complete assessment of their uh, of, uh, of the landscape in front of them when they join, and then they should pick three biggest problems that they've got, solve those three problems. Yeah. Don't try and solve a hundred. Solve that. Put all of their effort, all of their money literally every ounce of focus into solving those two, three, or four problems. Yep. Solve those. They're clearly, if they're the biggest ones, they're going to have an impact on their job and the, and the, and the, and the, the, 
the desire to keep the role that they've got and to, to you know grow their influence and impact on that business but that takes leadership that takes experience that takes a desire to actually solve the problems do you think educating the other management and the board is a function because i remember when i was a cmo right i mean we were killing it on all the sort of metrics that you you and i would agree are important right lead generation conversion of leads yeah. share a voice and then you know you'd be presenting on this kind of stuff and then someone would say yeah but i was in the dubai office the other day and i didn't like the poster in the toilet you know and it's like how do you get everybody to the same level talking um, about marketing? Uh, so let's just say the person that said that was you know the cfo i'd be like yeah i don't like your accounts <laughs> Yeah, and then he, and then he'd quite go, antagonistic, right? Well, no, it, no, yeah. but the point there is he'd then go, whoa, like, I'm a trained accountant. Exactly. And so, and I'd go, well, I'm a trained marketer. So, like, I, you know, I'm not antagonistic for the sake of it. Like, I would make the point that you don't have a, a, an educated opinion about that poster. You don't. Like, I'm the marketer. I, I do. I make the poster in that instance, yeah? I don't tell you how to do the accounts. Have some respect for what I do, and I have some respect for what you do. Yeah, and I think it comes back to the same point you made earlier on, which is, it's you know, it's it's it just feels so accessible. So it feels like everybody's entitled to have a strong voice about marketing. But you're right; it's it is actually a profession. Yes, with- consensus yeah. creates mediocrity. That's Olivier Toscani quote. I'm not interested in consensus. I hate compromise. I'm interested in producing the best possible work. And so that, that isn't a team, that isn't the board, you know, 15 people signing off on the campaign. That's one person, the CMO, signing off on a campaign. So they really, so the CMO needs to have massive autonomy when it comes yeah. to... Because in the, right, same way as all, in yeah. the same way that all of the other people that make up that board also have autonomy. Yeah. Like the, the chief tech officer has autonomy. The head of product has autonomy. The CFO has autonomy. The head of supply. Yeah, this is so true. Because, it, and then when it comes to brand, there's you're in these endless workshops seeking conformity, yeah. and you end up with the with the kind of work that doesn't stand out. You know, just want to revisit for a second this idea of ad tech, right? Because what, one of the things that people say is that it's launched a whole bunch of new companies, direct to consumer companies, Warby Parker and people like that. Yeah, and when I hear that. You know, I think part of it's true, right? Definitely the internet has created a new route to the customer. Yes. But I think the bit that's mi- misdiagnosed is that somehow the actual marketing effort, the messages and all those things don't matter anymore. Because what is, in a way, listening to you, I'm I'm thinking the what people like Warburg, Warby Parker had was, sure, they had a, di- you know, a direct route to customer and they could listen to the customer and they could feedback that, you know, those insights into the product. And, and these, you know, and, and in a way, c- c- companies historically had a sort of more indirect relationship with the customer. Yeah. So that's changed. But but really what's changed is that the big companies, you know, are changing their CMO every 18 months. They're not standing out. They're not coming up with personality and interesting messages. And so that's created an opportunity for smaller companies to do it better, I think. It's, a, yeah. it's almost like... I think we're almost misdiagnosing the problem by yeah. saying it's because those are not the, so being a D to C brand, so yeah. direct to consumer, isn't the same as therefore throwing the rule book out the window and going, well, uh, because we're D to C, we can avoid traditional media and we'll do everything digitally. No, it's, D to C just means you don't put it in a shop. It's not sold to a retailer. That doesn't mean all other rules uh, yeah. and all other practices that work should be thrown out the window and it's 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 madness the the reason why dollar shave club in, in, incidentally dollar shave yeah that's what yeah incidentally uh dollar shave was, was was not a the, film with uh, <laughs> matthew mcconaughey yeah. <laughs> the incidentally uh, sold to unilever he sold it didn't he for maybe a it was i want to say maybe a billion <laughs> it's a, great um, it's a so huge you sort of, number you sort of you know you unbundle unilever and then you rebundle under unilever so yeah. it's this yeah this um, massive transfer of wealth from unilever to yes so i mean the, the reason that was successful i mean it was successful because it was a dtc brand but the reason it was known and was successful uh, wasn't because of their digital media because they didn't do a great deal of that it was because the launch video has been watched a hundred million times on youtube like that is, that is the reason it's successful. That's the reason why you know about that brand and I know about that brand because the, the launch video 
was a piece of genius and it got noticed. It was different to every single other launch vehicle. And I think that is his model change yeah. as well, right? Yeah, it was, he, it was he, he changed the, yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. But that wasn't the reason for success. The reason for success yeah. Yeah. was because millions of people had heard about it. And then they were like, oh, and I don't have to go to the shop and I don't have to spend 25 quid every time I want to buy a razor. No, I can spend a couple of dollars a month and they get delivered to me and they're decent razors. That's the reason why they, and, I, and they get delivered direct to me. That was the reason, you know, it, it grew. But the reason was because everyone had heard of it. And the reason everyone had heard of it was because they got noticed. And the reason everyone saw it was because they were different in how they pitched themselves. They took a risk. But do you think that within marketing, the sort of relative importance of the four Ps might have changed a bit? I.e. that maybe promotion isn't quite as important as it was vis-a-vis -vis product, because the product, you know, you have, or vis-a-vis or mm. -vis price, or vis-a-vis -vis place. Because mm. in a world where the consumer has a bigger voice and the consumer has a bigger impact on sales, you might argue that product matters more. Is your point that the the the, the waiting of the four? Point. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Sees one out. Did yeah. you have a point there? Um, no, no, that's that's unfair. No, is, yeah, the, that's is the is the point is, is is the waiting change? Yeah, because it's, it seemed to me that in the past, right, in the let's call it the industrial age, right, you could have a pretty crappy product, and you, if you spent enough money on broadcasting it through you know through mass communication channels, you could sell it. And part of what's changed is that that those same communication channels don't work as effectively as they, as they used to, which we've talked about. And then part of the problem is, is also that, you know, the consumer has more power than they had in the industry because the consumer has a bigger voice and, the, and we know more about the consumer. And so we have to make better products as well. And I think this is alongside the, the, the desire for sort of more sustainable, locally sourced products. And so I think the whole sort of hipster move, movement in a way is like, a desire to have just better quality stuff because we can, mm. because we can afford it. Because no, I don't agree. So the the, the uh, I think people have been bothered by you know decent products since the dawn of time. And actually, you know, if you if you go back to where really where like consumerism started, probably in the US, you know, in the at the turn of the turn of the century, the products were really good. They were built to last. It's only as you know, product semantics and the the idea that we're designing a product to last a year, so that then somebody buys another one and then another one, we can make more money like that. You know that, that idea that really only came in over the last sort of twenty, thirty years or so. I think you know if we think back to where consumerism started, the products were built to last, and they were really good products. Now there were less products, there was less competition, there was a, a far more open competitor landscape you know it wasn't as crowded but i don't agree that the, the 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 waiting has changed i think it's really important to stick to those and give them the waiting that we always have the the, the i suppose the the slightly larger point here is that it's way easier to sell a dream if you can say this old thing is dead i have the answer to the new world like who the hell's yeah, no, no, oh shit, like, I don't want to get left behind. Let me listen to this person. And it's a snake oil salesman. And I think, no, like, the, and nobody ever got rich by saying it's largely going to stay the same next year. It's sticking to traditional methods is what will grow businesses and brands. But that doesn't, that doesn't grow agencies and that doesn't keep CMOs uh, 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 in tenure. They need to be able to go, what you've been doing for the last, you, 18 months is all rubbish, right? I'm here to save the day. And that's, that's not, don't do that. You look at some of the most successful brands in the world, they don't swap and change their senior leadership that often. You know, it is really stable tenure at, these, at, the, at the really senior um, yeah. levels and a trust in those people. I think the point I was trying to make, which is, I guess, is a truism and you wouldn't contest, which is that. In the past, you could have a relatively mediocre product and great marketing, and that would work. And now yeah. it's harder with a mediocre yeah. product and great marketing. I think you need a great product and great marketing is what I'm saying. Yes, you, I mean, and that's always been true. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, uh, so, so you're just I, saying it's a universal truism, and for a while it wasn't true because 
because you know the TV was just such a dominant. Channel. I mean, that, yeah, it, it, it's like TV is still very dominant. It isn't quite as dominant as it was. You know, it might slip a percent in terms of the uh, the amount of eyeballs that it gets over a, a period of time, and then you know the minute it slips from. 90 to 89 percent or something like that you know the people like, well, tv's dead you're like are you are you insane no it's just ever so slightly not quite as dominant as it was is there a a general trend that the, the media landscape is changing and therefore you have yes but we're like <laughs> it yeah. moves really slowly those types of uh, behavior changes not nearly as quickly as people think that it is and, and if you're selling ad tech then you're like this is the end of the world. Yep. You must, you must change. Like, no, that is not the case. It is the is the point you're making. Sorry, the point you're making is, if you had a mediocre pro- product, you could just put it on TV. In the seventies, you could do that and you'd get away with it. Yeah, you could. Now, if people see through that, and the consumer is more powerful. But that doesn't mean that the four Ps don't yeah. don't sort of sit as well as they did. And then, on that point, Val. Because it seems to me that a lot of where marketing's changed as well is maybe maybe again it's not true. Maybe I'm sort of exaggerating, mm-hmm. but this idea that you know that we've gone from sort of having a mass consumer to to what people call now multitude, right? So mass to a multitude, and this idea that the consumer's networked, the consumer therefore becomes way more important as an advocate of the product, and and I, and I guess anticipating we are going to say you need to create that emotional pull. You need to get the consumer excited through marketing. But where do you stand on things like influencers? I mean, I think it's bollocks. (laughs) I suspected you were going to say that, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, that. um, uh, this idea that influencers are this brand new, shiny, magic bullet that are available to marketers is rubbish. Brands have been paying celebrities to endorse their product for decades, and that is an influence. Is Is the wider point that word of mouth and having advocates that, you know, having people that are a um, consumer of that product and then they advocate it to their friends, that is incredibly powerful. But in a way, it's like, it, every, every, so everything that we talk about is true, right? And it has been true forever, which is, if I love the product, I'll tell my friends. Yeah. But I suppose we've amplified the voice of the consumer now. So the consumer kind of advocating on your behalf has more impact than it did in the past. Why? Well, because the consumer's connected. I mean, I... Yeah, but that we, doesn't... Yeah, no, uh, that would be to suggest that just because they're connected, it has value in that connection. And I don't think that's true. So the 1960s housewife uh, that would ha- that would sit around with their friends, let's say they got, you know, a bunch of other housewives around for a cup of tea, and there's five or six of them, that is very influential. Like they're able to like you said, like look them in the eye. I have got this thing, probably holding the thing that they've bought. I bought this thing and it's great. That is really powerful. Um, putting on Instagram, I bought this thing and it's great, isn't the, it doesn't have the same power and resonance. And just because it's then broadcast to your 500 followers on Instagram doesn't mean then that you're uh, at 500 times being you know, influencing 500 people rather than five. I don't agree. I don't. I don't think that it is anywhere near as powerful or have as much resonance, just because it's on social media. I, I agree that it has bigger reach, as in like it goes further. But I don't think it's as powerful. In a way, whether we agree on that or not, the 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 conclusion is the same, which is you want a product people love and yeah. you want a brand that people love. That should be the starting point. Yes, and not let's get lots of people to put on Instagram how much they love our product. Just get them to love your product and they will do a lot of the legwork for you. What's next for you? So what are you working on now? That's, so I guess you're already planning the, the next TFR event for next year or the or the event scheduled for next year. Are you going to do anything with this bland guidelines? Are you going to turn that into some sort so, of uh, you know, looking, mock awards? So yeah. That would be hilarious. Um, I'm actually, event. so I, I was speaking on a panel with Vicky, the uh, copywriter that I um, wrote it, and we produced it with. And I was speaking on a panel last week and we, we, we've become really good friends and we speak on a relatively regular basis, but actually we'd never spoken on the same panel and we were getting drunk on the panel because it was in a pub. And we just kind of turned to each other and said, it would be great to present the bland book together at, at conferences and things and actually take the take people through the book and present it to them together so the the copy side of it and the art direction side of it shock horror advertising in a duo so so anyone out there runs conferences that wants uh, us to present the bland book should get in touch because that would be a really good fun 
thing to to do. And I think it's really powerful because I think it's, it's a, almost like a shock tactic. People go, oh, right. And they see themselves in it. And it's really, I mean, that's, I think, one of the powers of, of the satire. So anyone that wants to book me for that, and me and Vicky will we'll definitely come along. It's the plan for next year. We're going to do more TFRs. We don't have the date for uh, the next one next year, but it will be probably in March. And we, don't, we don't really do things January, February because... Well, I've got to think about what we're going to do. Yeah, um, I guess you're skiing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then what's the plan for us? We've got quite a few really cool projects in the pipeline uh, that we'll be launching in Q1 of 2020. So, yeah, we're going to be doing that, getting our, you know, getting our name out there as much as possible. Great. Um, Paul, thank you so much for your time. So if I'm going to attempt, I think badly, to try to summarize what we discussed, and I think what you've told us, right, is you've, in a way, you've brought us back to first principles, right? You've debunked a lot of the crap that people talk about. You've highlighted that marketing is a discipline, is a profession Mark- that brings demand, gets you noticed. It can be measured, but it can never be precisely measured. And that's, you know, that's a rabbit hole that we shouldn't go down. Right? And that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. And then the tool set may have changed, but it's not about the tools anyway, which is my ultimate conclusion, which is strategy and craft matter and they matter more probably than, the, than they ever have right because yeah. the consumers more attention poor than ever. Than, than ever yeah it's it's more important to be really good at what we do than it has ever been i'm into that thank you very much for coming in and doing the podcast with us yeah no worries thank you for listening to structural shifts by aperture to learn more about our aperture community visit aperturehub.co we are strategy for the networked age until next time